Hello Zimbabwe, welcome to yet another exciting episode of uh, Economic Forum. My name is Tawanda Gudlanga. By popular demand, we have yet again the Procurement Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe Prize. And um, this follows uh, an interview we had with the Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Nyasha Chizu, on various issues to do with the mandate of a prize. And we are focusing on some of the questions that you, uh, the viewers, raise, particularly on how procuring entities who conduct procurement above their stipulated threshold are supposed to register with prize as a procurement management unit. According to Section 15 of the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Act, Chapter 22-23, a procuring entity shall not initiate or conduct any procurement proceedings in which the value of the procurement requirement is at or above the prescribed threshold unless the procuring entity has been generally authorized by the authority to conduct such proceedings. And in the studio, I have once again, Mr. Nyasha Chizu, the CEO of Praz. Welcome to Economic Forum. Thank you. Well, you're back again because a lot of questions uh, have been coming through as feedback. But we want to sort of uh, zero in on a number of key issues so that our listeners get to understand more. And we want to focus on the procuring uh, entities. When is a procuring entity supposed to apply for authorization uh, to conduct procurement above its stipulated limit? Thank you so much, Tawanda. When the act was promulgated on the 1st of January 2018, all the requirements of the act were supposed to be followed. And section 15 of that act stipulates that a procuring entity should apply for authorization from the authority. And this application is a once-off application, which is which are supposed to be done on the 1st of January 2018, covering for a period of two years, which means the application should, is covering the transitional period up to 31st December 2019. So every procuring entity needs to have applied uh, for authorization from the um, authority. Now, when you talk about authorization, let's, let's first understand what you mean by authorization. Yeah. Authorization to conduct procurement, we are saying it's like a license, it's like a permit which is issued to a procuring entity to conduct procurement. Why this was necessary is government realized that procurement is a strategic policy lever and we need to professionalize. As we work towards the vision of His Excellency, Vision 2030, towards an upper middle income economy, it means our procurement needs to be effective. Our procurement needs to be economic so that we achieve the vision. So this is why we are now ensuring that we authorize procuring entities after they satisfy the requirements of the Act in terms of organizational structure, in terms of their procurement planning, in terms of all the host of the things that are listed in the Act. Then we are given the authority that now you can now do your procurement following the law. I understand that there is a stipulated limit that you authorize to uh, public uh, sector entities. And then they have to apply and also get authority over uh, its stipulated limit. Why do you have these caps and then authorize again when they want to go above those limits? The cap which is there is when you are having a construction uh, procurement over 200,000 you need to be authorized, which means you need to have put in place systems that are capable of handling such procurement. When you are handling procurement of goods more than 100,000, you need to have systems that respond to the requirements of the Act. When you are procuring services over 50,000, you need to be authorized. So what we are saying is, where there is significant amount of expenditure, there is need for systems to support that expenditure. This is why we come in to authorize. But the question is, if the man, if, if you are the, the regulatory authority, you might as well do the procurement itself rather than authorize entities to, to, to procure. Are you not still coming back to the old mode which then had its own loopholes? The issue about our authorization is not a transactional authorization. It's a permit for you to conduct your transactions. 
So the issue of transactional authorization has been delegated according to the Act in terms of Section 14 to the accounting officer. So the accounting officer now, who is the CEO of a parastatal or the uh, town clerk of a local authority or a chief executive officer or the permanent secretary of a ministry, these are the people who are now responsible for authorizing the transactions within the entity. However, our act is provided for what we call a special procurement oversight committee. Which is, head, which is chaired by the Attorney General, deputized by the Accountant General, and there is a Director, Principal, Director of Public Works. These just review procurement decisions to see whether they have followed the spirit of the law. But the decision is for the Accounting Officer. Why this is necessary? It is because once someone approves a decision, the responsibility of that decision now is with the one that is approved. So the ACT has limited the approval of a decision to the accounting officer so that the back stops there. And um, obviously the issues around the raw of PRAS also are being questioned when we talk about the registration. It's 11 months since the promulgation of uh, uh, the law uh, happened and um, the question is, so have we had these public sector entities register? Have they registered? Have they all complied? Because obviously 11 months, we should see some traction happening. Yes, uh, it is actually an issue of concern to us. We are looking at, in terms of our public entities, we are looking at around 256. And I think we are less than halfway the mark in terms of those who have registered. And for that reason, we are actually coming up with a forum uh, in, in a short space of time where we are going to review the implementation of the law to see how far we have gone and also to try to ident identify what could be the problems with procuring entities. Because yes, what I've noticed is we had engaged uh, local authorities on their forums, and with that discussion, I can say local authorities are now uh, moving towards complying with the requirements of registering. But with the other parastatals, there is a, an issue. The level of traction is very low. Then how does a procuring entity apply to be registered? Probably they do not know uh, the existence of PRAS and uh, um, they do not even understand the registration process, Mr. Chief. Yes, uh, we have tried to uh, conscientize accounting officers by way of circulars. In terms of the act, if you go to section 15, it will refer you to the second schedule, which has got the requirements. The requirements are very simple. What this act is uh, pushing for is when you do procurement, you need to have planned. So one of the requirements is submit your procurement plan. And we have on our website a, a template in terms of how do you come up with a procurement plan. It's a new instrument, so we are assisting. Then the second thing is, now that procurement is now regarded as strategic policy lever. There were issues to do with organization of procurement. Before, procurement was an admin and finance function in some areas. Some would take it as, a, as an operational function where the procurement person is reporting to operations. But now this act is saying the accounting officer need to be directly responsible for the entity. So we need the structure of the procuring entity for us to assess whether the accounting officer is complying with the requirements of this law. Then we also want the structure of the procurement management unit, which is uh, defined by the law, to, for us to see whether this structure supports this requirement. Apart from these two issues, there is also the need, we need a, a report from uh, the requirement of the act in terms of the procurements that were done in the past two years. So these are the three simple things that are needed for the application. Join us in the second segment as we seek to understand what happens to those that do not follow the law and, of course, what the public sector can learn from the forthcoming uh, issues to do with procurement. Join us then.
Welcome back to Economic Forum. My guest is Mr. Nyasha Chizu, the Chief Executive Officer of uh, the Procurement Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe, PRAS, as we are focusing on how procuring entities who conduct procurement above their stipulated threshold are supposed to register with the uh, regulatory authority. Now, before we went to the break, you were talking about the law of traction, but what is a procurement? What, what happens when a procurement uh, entity fails to obtain authorization to initiate or conduct any procurement uh, proceedings at or above the prescribed threshold uh, from a price? The law, actually, in terms of our regulations, it stipulates that if you conduct a procurement without being authorized, it's an offense, which actually has got a jail sentence and a fine or a both. So conducting procurement without being authorized is an offense. Should we take it that then from January 2018, the other half of the public sector entities that have not uh, gotten authority because they have not registered at all with PRAS will certainly face the music? Certainly. We have been actually encouraging procuring entities because there is firstly an issue that you have conducted procurement without being authorized. Then the second issue is you conduct procurement without a procurement plan. The, the third issue is you might conclude a procurement that require a review by the Special Procurement Oversight Committee. All these three are offenses, which we are actually encouraging procuring entities to seek condonation if there is a procurement that was conducted which is outside. Because if they don't seek that condonation, certainly it is going to be a criminal offense. Explain more on the condonation process. Who initiated the the, the deviant uh, entity or it is PRAS that then sort of gives condonation to these? Uh, Cond condonation is to the procuring entity that would have, have violated is the one that will seek condonation. And it will be up to the reviewer to see whether the uh, violation was a, of a criminal nature or it was mere administrative uh, oversight. So it is very critical that entities uh, clean their cupboards of the skele of these uh, skeletons. In the past few weeks, Mr. Chizu, um, we have seen a number of former ministers uh, and parastatal bosses being arraigned before uh, the courts accused of breaching uh, public procurement law. Does the procurement authority uh, uh, report ministers or parastatals, uh, parastatal bosses who would have breached the provisions of uh, the law? You will find in terms of these cases, they come in two folds. Initially, we do our own work in terms of monitoring and evaluation. And from a monitoring and evaluation process, we can identify some violations. And with that, at law, we are then required to refer these contraventions to relevant authorities, which is the DRP or the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission. Then, secondly, within organizations, the audits can also bring about issues. And these audits, uh, like the forensic audits or external audits, even internal audits, or even other parties can bring up issues and report directly to the authorities that there was a violation. And in such cases, and even in the cases where we do our own reviews, my office is responsible for issuing a statement of procedure. So for that reason, yes, some people we might not be happy with me as a person, but it is actually out of my role as the chief executive officer that I issue a statement of procedure. So a statement of procedure is merely stating what the procurement was supposed to be, the process that was supposed to be adopted in a procurement process. Not that I go for people, uh, it's, it's all about if one violates, the law will take its course. But let's talk about those that actually report to PRAS. Um, some would call them whistleblowers, if probably I was having this conversation with the anti-corruption commission, they talk about whistleblowing. Is there that sort of uh, mechanism where these whistleblowers are actually protected? Certainly. If someone brings in a case, normally we would write that we have heard this case from a, a, a source 
what is your response? We will not even tell them. Unless if it's something where someone is complaining officially, we would actually, it's not whistleblowing, we would then ask the procuring entity that, can you respond to these allegations? But if it's whistleblowing, we will simply go in and ask. There's a difference, Mr. Chizu, where you talk about um, having to write to the procuring uh, entity to respond, um, whereas probably the expectation is that you're supposed to take some sort of action, uh, maybe go and check for yourselves. Because um, if I got you correct there, you spoke about the transactional mandate to the accounting officer so that they, in my view, so that there are checks and balances. So why is it that you, you wait for them to respond rather than you know, swooping into action because issues of corruption are, are endemic in Zimbabwe and the expectation that with the coming of PRAS, we should be seeing more action rather than um, conversations happening in such instances. You will find we do our monitoring and evaluation in two ways. We can do it by way of a desk review where we ask, can we have your procurement report so that we can review it? Or we can actually go and uh, inspect. So we've got the power to request for information. Or we, and we also have the power to come and inspect a record. So it is up to us to check whether uh, the report requires physical inspection or we can do it by way of a desk review. Um, there were some viewers that were following closely to the conversation we had last time where um, you were talking about the, the, the promulgation of the law as at uh, January 2018. And yet there was the 2016 audit report that came from the Auditor General who uh, highlighted a number of, of, of issues to do with uh, uh, procurement. Are you going to deal with those or you're going to take into cognizance the 2017 uh, Auditor General report, which I understand is now out as well, um, to deal with some of these issues that um, the co commissions or omissions that would have actually happened during that particular year? You will find we don't have a limit in terms of um, the timelines. What the limit that we only have is when a procurement a matter involves procurement that was done before 31st December 2017, then when we are reviewing, we apply the Procurement Act which was repealed. Any procurement that was done after January, we will review it using this current uh, Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Act. So if there is anything that was done, whether it was done in 2009 or in 2015 or in 2018, we don't have time limits as to our review. We can review anything. Don't go away. Join us in the third and final segment as we talk to uh, Praz on the issues of procurement. Join us then. Welcome back. This is the Economic Forum, the third segment, where we are focusing on procurement with the Procurement Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe. With me is Mr. Nyasha Chizu, who is the Chief Executive Officer. Now, there's another question that came through uh, quite from a number of uh, school development associations where they wanted to understand where they stand in terms of procurement now. Do they also have to register with PRAS um, and do they have to get authority from, the, uh, from, from PRAS? You find when it comes to school development authorities, the distinction is when is procurement a procurement. School development authorities collect money on behalf of the school. So when it's, it's money that is being donated to the school, then it becomes public funds once it has been donated. Therefore, when there is a procurement that is going to be done using those monies donated to the school, then they need to follow public procurement processes. But you find school development committees sometimes, they donate projects. They might buy books for the school, or they might uh, procure a, a building for the school. So in that, such instances, the procurement is outside the public procurement processes. However, the 
SDAs will need to follow when it comes to books, the requirements of the Ministry of Education. When it comes to uh, property, if they are developing property, they need to follow public works uh, regulations because the donation is on a government property. So it will not follow public procurement processes, but it will follow other laws if it is a, a project that is being donated. And let's talk about your relationship uh, between public procurement, which you are generally mandated to do. Then there's private procurement. Um, there were some business organizations that also uh, wanted to know, because they are benchmarking the, the mandate of uh, PRAS to international best practice. Is there a way that they can also uh, utilize the provisions of the law uh, to actually um, uh, uh, solidify their procurement practices in, in, in the private sector? We are at law allowed to collaborate with anyone in relation to anything that is to develop procurement. So you find we've got an interest in the private sector, which is not direct. As much as the private sector is efficient, we procure efficiency in the public sector. So we've got quite an interest say that if private sector want us to assist them in terms of bringing in efficiency within their systems, we are very willing to work with them. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about Nyasha Chizu himself, the chief executive officer of, of PRAS. I mean, you were appointed uh, substantially in March 2018. And, um, you know, the, the, the assumption is that probably the vendettas or issues that probably you are pursuing on a personal matter, uh, which now are leading to some of these accusations flying all over um, uh, big wigs, as they are called, being arraigned before the courts. You will find the issues that are happening is not anything personal. I don't have a personal benefit out of these processes. It is only because of the responsibility that I was given, which in the case that I am out of this office, the next person who is going to be in that chair is also going to be doing the same things. So it's not anything personal. You find some of these uh, people that are actually being arraigned before the court. I meet them maybe for the first time in the court only to talk about how they violated. So it's not anything personal. So that one might think that uh, I want to deal with this person so that uh, my cases will, will go. No. The so, next so what happens when um, um, an, a case is brought before the courts, uh, you then have to represent PRAS as what? As a witness? You are the one that is bringing out the, 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 the way the breach would have taken place? What really happens? Yes, I, I am the state witness in terms of these cases where I give the statement of procedure where I talk about what processes were supposed to be followed, then the state would then look at uh, whether whatever actions that was done by that person was in line with the requirements of the Act. And you are talking about the Act and, and a strict adherence of the Act, but we do have uh, the political office. Some say the minister may make a decision you know, and, 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 and allow certain provisions of the law to be overlooked. Are we saying that they would have breached the law, they cannot use their ministerial uh, power to actually then allow or authorize a, a parastatal within their, 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 their portfolio to actually so undertake procurement? With our act in terms of section 16, it actually says the minister is not supposed to issue a directive and if a minister issues a directive, that directive will need to be in writing. And once it's in writing, the accounting officer can implement it, and the responsibility now goes to the minister or the board member who would have given that directive. You find this provision is also there in terms of, should be section 14 of the Public Finance Management Act. A minister is not supposed to issue an operational decision. A minister is supposed to issue a decision on policy. Say so that if we say, like, uh, well, what the Minister of Transport has recently said, that we, the road to between uh, Mashingo and uh, Arare is now being dualized using local funds. That's a policy issue. Now, is the Secretary for Transport now who is going to make a decision in terms of who is going to be the contractor, not the minister uh, uh, pinpointing that, give it to so and so. We can't do that. But are there any safeguards, really, 
where we look at such instances because um, that's what has been uh, dogging the, the previous administration where uh, ministers would give directives or it is alleged they would give uh, directives with impunity. Are there any safeguards? Have you also, as PRAS, reached out to cabinet ministers so that they are aware of what the provisions of the law say, particularly the section 16 that you spoke about? Yes, you find when the new ministers were sworn in, the chief secretary organized a, 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 a induction a workshop where I had a slot to sensitize ministers, to sensitize permanent secretaries on the provisions of this new act. So it is clear to the ministers and the deputy ministers. Was it sufficient? I feel it was very sufficient because it was the ministers there seated learning about what the limits are in terms of procurement decision making. Talking about, of course, uh, the existence of PRAS, what can you say has been the biggest, biggest uh, milestone for you? As we implement the law, we are seeing a change, which change you find comes with a bit of resistance. We are seeing a bit of resistance within procuring entities as they set up. They are still finance directors, they are still human resources managers who still wants to be doing procurement. And we are saying procurement is now responsibility of a procurement officer assisting the accounting officer. And that change we have actually seen quality decisions coming up. The level of decisions that are coming, we are seeing that there is a, a value that is being added when a procurement officer who is supposed to be uh, getting the quotations is actually part of the decision making. Unlike before, a procurement officer would get quotations, give it to someone else, and within that spectrum, you know, corruption was being enshrined and no one was uh, taking responsibility of such actions. Mr. Nyata Chizu, thank you so much for joining us uh, here on Economic Forum. I know the conversation will certainly continue because there are a number of issues that you must uh, respond to. My guest was Mr. Nyata Chizu, the Chief Executive Officer of the Procurement Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe, PRAS, as we're focusing on procuring entities who conduct procurement above their stipulated threshold. Join us again next time. But remember, uh, do send us your feedback on the number that is appearing on your screen. My name is Tawanda Gutlanga. Until we meet again next time, it's pleasant viewing.